Welcome everyone to a new edition, a new edition of the Trish Regan Show. And we have a little bit of good news here, a little bit of bad too, but good news for Donald Trump in that he may actually have the money that Letitia James is looking for. The bad news is she's looking for it so hard, she's already preparing some asset seizures at this very moment. We're going to get into all of it. Plus, plus, even CNN is having, having to admit right now that Mar-a-Lago may actually be worth hundreds of millions of dollars instead of the $18 million that Letitia James, the government, thinks it's worth. So does this mean that it is time for some intervention? I mean, we're, we're waiting on the appeal, but maybe something bigger. Vivek Ramaswamy does think so. In fact, Vivek is out there today saying we need, we need the Supreme Court to weigh in on this one. The Supreme Court can tell us just exactly what's fair here because it comes back down to the, the Eighth Amendment, you know, the Constitution that I have to keep on my desk And by my nightstand, because this is what we're eating, sleeping, and breathing. We are on the front lines of something very big right here in this country right now. And there's a lot of change that could happen, and not the good kind of change, ladies and gentlemen. I want to remind you that we are brought to you, as always, in part by Legacy Precious Metals, our good friends over there. Charles Thorngren and Company, 1-866-589-0560, 1-866-589-0560. I want to talk about gold a little bit later in the program because of some things that Jerome Powell said at the Fed meeting yesterday and some things that Janet Yellen just said today. That would be our Treasury Secretary. But before we do, back to what's going on right now here in the present. Donald Trump could be worth a lot of money very soon. We are hours away from a company called Digital World Acquisition Corporation merging with Trump's media and tech group, which owns True Social. So the expectation is that the deal could actually go through, get signed, sealed, and delivered as early as Friday. Now, if that happens, come Monday, DWAC is going to become DJT on the stock exchange and will be the media company for Donald Trump and True Social, of which he owns the majority of it, some 70% or so. So the valuation as of today, take a look at that stock price, right? This is just a, a few weeks ago when it emerged that the SEC was okay with DWAC doing this deal with True Social. And so once the SEC, after they put him through H E double L and back, said, okay, you know, where all systems go, the stock jumped massively. And the primary beneficiary of that is the primary owner in the company, which would be Donald J. Trump, who is going to be right there on the ticker symbol DJT, assuming it trades on Monday. Now, he can't cash out right away. He's got to wait about six months, which would put us out into what, September. A lot of people tend to think that this particular company is going to be almost a proxy for whether or not he's going to win the election, right? You know how sometimes you see the stock market trading based on who might win the presidency. And this particular company might actually really be affected by that. It's expected anyway. So if that's the case, then it could be worth even more than $3.5 billion. $3.5 billion is said to be his stake at present day value come September. Then again, investors could get nervous. They could say, oh, you know, what if, what if he's going to sell the company? What if he's going to unload that big, big, giant three and a half billion dollar stake in the company and they could drive it down? But we'll see. We'll see. The point is, he's about to make a lot of money. A lot of money. And you know what? He's going to (laughs) need that money because Letitia James is like a dog with a bone and she's not letting this thing go. So the good news is he's got the possibility of a heck of a lot coming in the door very, very soon. The meeting is happening tomorrow now. My sources say they think they're there. They think they've got everybody where they need to be. This has been a a trying SPAC deal all along. A SPAC deal is a special acquisition group, right, where you, you come together, special purpose acquisition 
corporation where you get a whole bunch of money together and you say, you know, we're going to go out and buy something. And this particular SPAC went out and it bought Trump Media and Tech, which runs True Social. So it bought True Social by merging. It's, it's a different way to do a, a merger. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to go buy this. You, you get together. It's actually a different way, I should say, of doing an IPO. Because some of the IPO standards can be kind of difficult. And Donald Trump being who he is, they didn't think maybe they could IPO something like True Social. But they could, in fact, get it out into the, the hands of the public, into shareholders' hands, by doing what's known as a SPAC deal. Now, SPAC deals have come under a lot of criticism in recent years. I will say that there's been plenty of good ones in our history, but some recent ones have kind of faltered and they've been seen as vehicles that, you know, okay, the investors take their money out and they leave the regular day folks high and dry. And that's one of the concerns here. That might be why if people think Donald Trump's going to get out of the stock ahead of September or around September when his shares are actually mature and he can, uh, he can in fact do that, then you might see some valuation changes. But I think it's going to be a really interesting one to watch. And it just cracks me up because, you know, the left is like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. After everything that we're trying to do. And now he's got this company that could potentially be worth that. Very interesting times. Here's a headline from the Wall Street Journal. How Trump could make billions from struggling truth social. Because you know what? Everyday investors are out there and they're like, I want this. I want this. And it's going to be traded under the ticker symbol DJT. So... The company isn't really making a lot of money. I mean, I think that the revenue came in somewhere around $6 million or so for True Social. So it's, it's not like it's raking in cash. And you know, you know, Twitter's having its share of issues. So Truth theoretically could have its shares of issues. But Truth has DJT as its ticker symbol potentially come Monday. Very, very soon. I do think that they're going to be able to pull it together and this deal will happen. And so then it becomes, okay, is this really a proxy on Trump or is it investors making educated decisions about or earnings and how the companies run, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interestingly enough, we did get another company going public just today. That would be Reddit, a social media company. And Reddit surged 48%, trading uh, out the day at $50 and 44 cents a share. It went similar kind of a, uh, it went public, I should say, at a similar valuation to what truth is being put at. So we'll watch, we'll watch. I think it, it could be that as early as Monday, you're going to be seeing a company under the ticker symbol DJT being traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And interestingly enough, you have a lot of just like everyday folks that'll be like, okay, I want to own a share of that because I believe in Trump. And, you know, whether or not you should be buying a stock for those reasons, we can, we can have that conversation another time. I'm not advocating in that in any way, shape, or form. But I do think you have to be mindful of the momentum there and sort of just the, the everyday public's hunger for something like that if, in fact, it does go public through this merger. And I think it, you know, look, the SEC approved it. Now they just have to go to the shareholder vote. The shareholder vote is happening tomorrow and it looks like they're there. So ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump on paper, on paper anyway, is going to be a whole lot richer probably by next week. <laughs> All right. Like, so take that Letitia. Okay. Hey, quick reminder. If you haven't subscribed, do that for me. Make sure you subscribe to this show. It is so important. You hit the bell I saw we got a new subscriber. I'm looking at the live chat. We're going to get to some of your comments in a bit, but make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, give it a like, give it a share, all that stuff, because we've got to get the word out there, right? We got it. We're, we're growing. We're growing hand over fist, and it's all thanks to you. I'm just amazed by this, amazed by this platform and the, uh, the hunger for all of you guys to really have some truth in, in reporting and in journalism. Imagine, imagine. I mean, forget these big institutions where they're telling you what to say and you got a prompter to read and this, that, and the other, right? It's kind of nice to have this direct relationship. Look, it's a smaller operation, but we're growing. And I will say there's authenticity in, in this and what you're seeing on YouTube. If you're, if you're over on Facebook, you can join the live conversation on YouTube, but we thank you for being on Facebook as well. Rumble, again, uh, another one of our platforms. How Trump could make billions from struggling truth social. The company 
trading down just a teeny touch today, but still, you look at the overall valuation, and you're talking about a company that's worth some $6 billion, and that means Donald Trump could get $3.5 billion, which would mean, come September anyway, he'd have the money to pay off Letitia James in New York City if it hasn't already gone to the Supreme Court or been appealed and, and gone away by then. But you see, by then isn't really going to work because there's word out today that she is just, you know, sharpening the knives, ladies and gentlemen, sharpening the knives so that she can take part of his real estate because that's what they want to do, you see. Letitia James looking to seize assets. She promised she would. She did a little interview with ABC just a few weeks ago. Watch. Four days after a judge ordered Donald Trump to pay $355 million for a decade of fraud, New York Attorney General Letitia James says she's prepared to do everything she can to make sure the former president pays his fine, including, she told us, seizing the buildings that bear his name. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. Four days after a judge ordered Donald Trump. So Letitia James is doing exactly that right now. So he doesn't have the money. We can talk about that. I, I, I want to get to that in a second because it is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, not only is this case ludicrous, but the idea that you're going to charge someone a half a billion dollars in, in bail, like they, they have to post a half a billion dollars. I mean, how insane and ridiculous is that? And, and that gets us to the Eighth Amendment, which we'll talk about. But this is insane. Anyway, I want to tell you what she's doing. The New York Attorney General's office has filed judgments in Westchester County, where former President Trump's golf resort and private estate known as Seven Springs is located. And this is the first step you see, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of her ability to seize that asset. So she wants to go after the golf resort there in Westchester County. And I'm like, Wow, this feels like Venezuela, right? This is like Hugo Chavez saying, yeah, I like that golf course over there. Let me take that. I mean, for goodness sakes, the idea, the idea that a Letitia James is ever going to come in between a bank and the person they're lending to, their client, and try and decide what the valuation is on a home saying he lied, that it was fraudulent, he couldn't have said it was 18. He, she thinks it's 18 million. He thinks it's worth a heck of a lot more. But I'll tell you, even CNN is now being forced to admit that this is a property that's probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, since when, since when does a government bureaucrat get to decide what a, a property is actually worth? I mean, shouldn't that be something that the individual decides, the owner of the property, as well as the bank who's going to be lending that individual money. If the bank didn't think it could get the money back, it, it needs to then go after the asset. So if the asset is Mar-a-Lago, the bank then needs to know that it could sell Mar-a-Lago to pay off the money that it lent, right? I mean, that's, that's how it works. And yet Letitia's flying in out of nowhere and saying, nope, nope, nope. I mean, look, Granted, you know, you can't say the square footage is one thing when it's another. However, he did put on there, you know what? You got to actually do your own diligence, you know, buyer beware. So there were disclosures in there. The bank was fine with it all. And yet Letitia comes out of the blue saying, nope, and now you're going to pay us a half a billion dollars. It is truly the most insane thing I've ever heard he clearly thought that. Let me share with you some of his talking points when he was leaving the courtroom just a few weeks ago as this was all going down. This is Donald Trump just losing it on the system because the system, if that's the system, is not a is not an American based, constitutionally based system. It's something else entirely. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We're at a trial today that should not be taking place. As you know, the head of Deutsche Bank recently testified, just testified. And he said that Trump did nothing wrong. We made a loan. We were very happy with the loan. We got paid back. There were no defaults. It was a very good transaction, and he would do it again. He was a very powerful witness. And we have other executives coming in from banks that will say the same thing. This is a disgraceful situation. This is an attorney general 
Letitia, that went out and uh, campaigned on, I will get Trump. I will get Trump no matter what. I'll get Trump. I promise I'll get her. We have two tapes on her now that have come out since the trial because people took tapes of her because they couldn't believe her ranting and raving like a lunatic. But just as the Attorney General of New York State, Letitia James, and she shouldn't be allowed to be Attorney General. She's defrauded the public with this trial. She said that Mar-a-Lago, she convinced the judge that Mar-a-Lago was worth in Palm Beach, Florida, the most expensive land in the world, I guess, that, and the most expensive houses definitely in the world, that Mar-a-Lago, the biggest house, the most spectacular place in all of Florida, was worth $18 million, when it's worth approximately, could be close to 100 times that amount. And based on that testimony, and based on her convincing the judge that Mar-a-Lago was worth $18 million, instead of a billion to a billion five, which would sell very easily, which we've already proven, but we'll have people come up and say that and prove it, the most important people, the brokers that make the sales. But based on that, he ruled against me. He ruled fraud. I mean, he said fraud. They are the fraudulent people. Because they ruled a house that was worth 18, they put down as worth 18 million, and it's worth maybe close to 100 times that amount. And based on that, they ruled against me having to do with fraud, which is a big statement. But they are the frauds. Because the house is worth a billion, a billion and a half, 750 million, it's worth a fortune most expensive house probably in the world and they said it was worth 18 million dollars and they didn't do anything about it but based on that and also Doral they have Doral at a very low number and it's worth many times the number that they put so they chose to do this so I just want to say the head of Deutsche Bank came in he said we were great the loan was great everything was fine uh, and it was Perfect. And this was their witness. It wasn't even my witness. And we have other bankers coming in saying the same. So remember now. Okay. So, it, it, look, $18 million for Mar-a-Lago is insane. I was just down in Palm Beach recently. I mean, these properties are going for hundreds of millions of dollars. It's utterly, utterly insane. Now, I mean, he, he's getting over his skis there with the $1.5 billion. At some point, he retracted it and said, well, $750 million. Whatever it is, it's not 18, okay? I think we can suffice to say, like, Letitia James is absolutely nuts to claim that it's, it's $18 million. I mean, look, even CNN, this is great. You guys have to see this because even CNN now is, like, having to admit that 18 is a really crazy valuation on this thing. And again, I get back to... Who is Letitia James to decide the value of the property? It's between the bank and the client. Thank you very much. I mean, who was harmed in this? Let me ask you that. Where's the victim? How, how do you have a, a half a billion dollars in a judgment against someone when there's literally no victim? I want to play this for you because CNN has had to admit that Mar-a-Lago is worth more than $18 million. They're trying to plan out, you know, what is he going to do? Is he going to sell it? Is it going to be a fire sale? That's what they all want, you see. They want him to declare bankruptcy and have a fire sale. You know, then, it, then it's double whammy. So take a look here. They had a realtor on, and the realtor is basically saying, you know, yeah, there's, there's no, I mean, like, it, it's worth a lot, okay? It's worth a lot. Watch. I think you need at least 30 days to get any of these properties sold. Um, but the property that you alluded to, Mar-Lago, uh, potentially, that could be something that could be sold quickly. I think the valuation is something in the hundreds of millions, and I think there could be a buyer for something like that. And that would be literally, if you're talking about doing that between now and Monday, that's picking up the phone, calling someone, and then literally writing a check. Yeah, I mean, there could be plenty of international people who want to buy that property. I mean, there's properties that are priced at 150 and 200 million that are nearby that. And Palm Beach is like the NVIDIA, NVIDIA, excuse me, yeah. of real estate. It's just shot up like a rocket. And people do want to live there. They've moved there. So I think that would be the best case scenario uh, as to proper if he's trying to sell quickly. I would encourage that. So, all right. Now, that's $240 million estimated. I mean, who knows? You know, he's a desperate seller in this case. Someone picks up the phone and makes that call this week. So I don't know what it would be. That's still half right. of what it would be. Hmm. 
$240 million is the estimate from Bloomberg. But again, who's Bloomberg? <laughs> I mean, great. It's, it's, it's a, it's a well-known financial news organization and seller of the Bloomberg terminals. I used to work there two times around. I started my career there and, and worked there again, actually running all their political coverage and did the market close show. Street Smart with Trish Regan. So Bloomberg is making this valuation. These are reporters, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. Again, like until you actually have the bankers in there making a decision or somebody actually buying it, then it, it's, it's irrelevant. Okay, it's absolutely irrelevant. Until you have an offer on the table and you got a willing buyer and a willing seller, it just doesn't matter. But they're all salivating at the idea, okay, well now, you know, maybe there'll be some calls coming in from around the world and he can sell it to somebody by Monday in order to avoid bankruptcy. I don't really see that one happening, but this is getting so crazy. Over on MSNBC, they're like, oh, well, he's got to do it, right? He's got to do it. He's got to do something. Maybe he'll sell it. Here's, here's MSNBC speculating about potential bankruptcy for Donald Trump. So, David, just to put a fine point on what Tim just said there, this from the Washington Post, this is what Trump land is saying. He'd rather have Letitia James show up with the sheriff at 40 Wall Street and make a huge stink about it than say he's bankrupt. He thinks about what is going to play politically well for him. Bankruptcy doesn't play well for him, but having her try to take his properties away might. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, look, I think give Donald Trump some more time to reconsider bankruptcy because, listen, he can flip a script on anybody and his followers will believe whatever he says. And the reality is bankruptcy is really the best option for Donald Trump and gives him the, the best ability to really delay actual consequences, which is his complete strategy. Because otherwise, Donald Trump is in a situation, but so is the nation, Alisa, where sometime in the next week, someone's likely going to own Donald Trump. And it could be a bad actor, a foreign actor. It could be a Putin, an MBS. It could be an Elon Musk. Or it could be Letitia James in the state of New York. But if Donald Trump is looking at actually having someone else now in control of his assets, yes, Donald Trump can use that for grievance, but he really doesn't like that scenario because without real estate, who is Donald Trump? I mean, in some ways, his real estate empire, at least the image of it, is bigger than his own presidency. So... You don't know. I, I, I think let's give Donald Trump a little bit of time to think about the bankruptcy option. He can play politically whatever he needs to, and his followers will buy it. Oh, Tim. my so, goodness. Um, so a few things to unpack in that one. You, you can tell they're, they're just hoping and praying he declares bankruptcy because they think somehow that will help them politically with Joe Biden. Like, nothing's going to help with Joe Biden, okay, guys? That, that ship has sailed. Like, America is just, you know, happy he can make it out of bed every day. Woken up by his little kitty cat. Seriously. They did a whole thing in the Daily Mail on, like, his, his day. That's how he's woken up, by his kitty cat. <laughs> anyway, we'll leave Joe Biden aside. Back to this. They, what are they going to say? Like, you can't even sell it to anybody? I mean, did you hear what the guy was saying? He's like, oh, well, it would be better to go to New York City and Letitia James. We're talking about the state seizing assets because if you listen to what that commentator on MSNBC was trying to get at, he didn't even think anybody from anywhere could buy. I mean, forget the fact that Hunter Biden was making $24 million from all these various different sources as a quote-unquote foreign lobbyist when he was never registered as one and then, by the way, never even declared the tax money on it <clears throat> or paid the tax money on it, <laughs> right? I mean, Wow. Uh, forget the fact that what, what did Al Gore's biggest claim to fame, he didn't create the internet, was that he sold his company, his television network, to a, a Middle Eastern, uh, not necessarily friend. So now we're going to say, <laughs> not only do you have to sell it, we're not even going to let you sell it to the, the people that are the highest bidders. I mean, this is just mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. And it, it's getting to the point where we're going to have some real issues to confront, frankly, as a country. Here's Letitia James outside the courtroom as this was all going down shortly before Arthur N. Gorin, the judge, issued that massive, insane, ridiculous judgment. We heard from uh, Donald Trump in our case against him, other defendants, and the Trump organization. He rambled, 
He hur hurled insults, um, but we expected that. At the end of the day, um, the documentary ev evidence demonstrated that, in fact, he falsely inflated his assets to basically enrich himself and his family. He continued to en persistently engage in fraud. Um, the numbers don't lie. And Mr. Trump obviously can engage in all of these distractions, and that what is what exactly what he did, what he committed on the stand today, engaged, engaging in distractions and engaging in name-calling. Um, but I will not be bullied. I will not be harassed. This case will go on. We look forward to hearing the testimony of Ivanka Trump on Wednesday, and then we plan on closing our case. Um, and then there will be some motions on Thursday. Um, and then uh, the defense okay, will okay, present okay, their okay. case. So we get the chief. picture. Um, um, justice. She, she wants you to know she won't be intimidated. <laughs> she, she's honestly, I mean, this is like bizarro land. Think about this. You have a rabidly political person in Letitia James who was put in that spot by people who said, we want you to get Trump. And she said, you better believe it. I'll go get Trump. I'll get Trump. I'll get Trump. And then you got a judge who decides it's going to be a, a half a billion dollars that they're going to fine him with. So now he's going to turn up with all this money. Unprecedented. Trump's lawyers actually filed something earlier this week, some 5,000 pages on how ridiculous and unprecedented this was. So there's no sense of fairness in any of this, ladies and gentlemen. It's just they want to go get them. And so how can that possibly work? We're going to get to that in a second because we're going to talk about the Eighth Amendment. But first, you know who's actively campaigning to make sure this doesn't happen to you as a small business owner? Our good friends over at JCN, Job Creators Network. You saw Alfredo on the show the other day. He's livid about this. He's, this is absolutely crazy. I've known Alfredo for a long time, and he's a, he's a tremendous guy. He started this organization that really is a grassroots effort to train small business owners all around the country and to help them advocate for themselves and their communities because you don't want politicians coming in and saying, okay, well, you're on the wrong side of the aisle. We're going to get rid of you today. No. Like, we can't have Letitia Jameses out there bullying small business owners. So if this is something that you want to be part of, and I encourage you to be part of it. I, hey, I'm a small business owner myself now. Do this. Go join JCN. Go to joinjcn.com and, and get all their information so that you can stay up to date on all the things that are happening in your community and you can be part of your community and making sure that you're protecting the law for business owners. Look, you know, the, the big companies, nothing against them, but they get all the lobbyists out there doing all their work for them, right? They're protecting themselves. Well, what do you do as an individual? And especially in the face of this stuff right now. So go join jcn.com today. Wonderful team of people there, really committed to making sure we preserve our capitalist roots, which is what we need to do. So this is a lot of money. A half a billion dollars. Nobody has that just like hanging around. Like, I don't care how wealthy you are. You don't have a half a billion dollars. Like, if you do, you're probably not that smart. You're, how could you be that wealthy? Because you know what? You, you don't leave your money in cash. It doesn't work for you just sitting in cash, especially these days with 18% inflation. That's not going to fly because you, you've, you've lost 18% by the end of the year. <laughs> your, your dollars are worth less. So you need to actually be invested, invested in something. I mean, this is a good chance for me to mention our good friends over at Legacy Precious Metals. You want to be invested in something, right? Because you want to keep up with inflation. So you can check them out, one 589 LegacyPMInvestments.com. Charles Thorngren comes on the show a lot. He runs the company, and he talks about the importance of diversifying yourself. Diversification is a big strategy with this team in charge, right? Because you don't want to wake up one day and have all that money that you saved not be worth anything. I mean, billionaires are smart with their money. They invest their money. One of those great ways to invest and diversify is through the ownership of gold. You know, the physical stuff in some cases, my next door neighbor growing up, he used to have gold, gold coins in, in his house, if you can imagine. I mean, that, that, he was a big believer in it, big believer. Some people have the gold coins in their, in their, in their uh, safe deposit box. 
at the bank, or you could at Legacy PM Investments actually get a vault. Imagine that. You can get a vault all to yourself down in Texas or overseas or in Nevada. They have, they have different vaults that you can choose from, and you can keep your money there and watch your money there, your gold, that is. <laughs> anyway, look, you, you got to be invested in something because of all this inflation, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But Donald Trump doesn't have $500 million just sitting around. If he did, then he wouldn't be Donald Trump. He wouldn't be the success he is. He wouldn't be that smart. You don't have that kind of money. And so he's got to come up with it some way, somehow. And so it's, it's challenging, right? You got to go to the credit markets, the bail markets, the bond markets, okay? So you go out to the credit markets and you say, I need this money. Well, a half a billion dollars is a lot of money to have to get. And they knew this, which is exactly why they put this incredibly onerous amount that's unprecedented on him. And that begs the question of whether or not that's really in keeping with who we are as a nation. I'll tell you, it's not. It's absolutely positively not. It, 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 is, it is so un-American in every single way, shape, or form. You know who gets this? Vivek Ramaswamy. He came out with a statement today, and he said this is absolutely atrocious. Letitia James is so political. This whole thing is political. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not who we are as Americans. And by the way, it ought to go to the Supreme Court, and somebody ought to take a look at the Eighth Amendment. So here we go. Let's listen to Vivek Ramaswamy with a statement he just released. The Letitia James crusade against Donald Trump is disgusting and is a threat to every American. When you have prosecutors who are elected to office on a promise of going after one particular individual as she campaigned on, then go on to keep a campaign promise using the legal system to do it, it's unjust. And this particular case reveals how ugly that is. In this case, you're talking about a crime for which there was literally no identifiable victim. The people who did business with Donald Trump weren't individual consumers. They were sophisticated financial institutions who made money from their dealings. And yet, Letitia James is using a consumer protection statute to literally make up numbers and say, hey, you have hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties that you owe. You have bond to post by a particular date of an unreasonable magnitude that even no billionaire is gonna regularly able to meet. And to say, if you don't do it, I'm going to start seizing your property. It's disgusting and it is a threat to not only private property, but threat to the justice system and to the rights of every American. But the good news is there is an argument to push back against this in short order. And that's the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment prevents the imposition of excessive bail or excessive fines. And if there's ever an example that meets that to a T, it's the bond that's been demanded of Donald Trump in this disgusting New York Letitia James-led prosecution. This is an opportunity for the Supreme Court to step in and say, no, no we're not going to stand for this kind of lawfare. Whether it's against Donald Trump or a Democrat, it's wrong. We don't want to empower prosecutors to be able to use bond and bail or bonds as a way of effectively achieving a goal that they couldn't achieve through the front door, which is bankrupting an opponent, even stopping them from being able to appeal those decisions. That's un-American. It needs to end now, not just for the protection of Donald Trump, but for the protection of every American. And in this disaster, I at least see a silver lining of some hope that that's exactly what we'll get from the Supreme Court. It's not just the current justices, not even the conservative ones that would necessarily agree with this principle. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a staunch defender of this part of the Eighth Amendment as well. She's no longer with us, but the other justices are. And I hope this can be another nine to zero rebuke of the kind of lawfare that we're seeing against Donald Trump and indirectly against every American in this country today. And I think it could be the most important Eighth Amendment case of the 21st century. I hope they bring it and I hope they succeed. The Letitia wow. James crusade against Donald Trump is disgusting. Think about that, threat. guys. So basically, the, the Eighth Amendment says that excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Is this not excessive? A half a billion dollars? I mean, I, I think it's very excessive. Very, very excessive. So I think Vivek Ramaswamy, gosh, I like that guy. I really, I mean, he, he's really smart. And I, uh, I, I think he's got a big future in the Republican Party. I think he's got a big future in the Trump cabinet, 
maybe even vice presidency. I don't think so, though. I'm, I'm hearing different things. But he's very, he's a very interesting guy. He might make a great Treasury Secretary. A lot of other things he could do as well. But Vivek Ramaswamy hitting the nose on the head. In other words, you can't have this excessive bail. I mean, this is, this is like, you know, the crime. Does, does the punishment fit the crime? If you assume that, okay, he, he should not have inflated the valuation as he saw it to be for his properties, or he shouldn't have inflated square footage, whatever you want to go with. Is it really a half a billion dollars? No, it's because of who he is and because of the politics of the moment and because they are trying to take him down. So it should go to the Supreme Court. I'm just sitting there going, wait a second, why hasn't this been in the appellate court as of yet? I think the Supreme Court would say, okay, it's got to go to the appellate court first, and then it would get kicked up to the Supreme Court. So we need that to happen at the very, very least. But what's wild, and maybe this is a reason for the Supreme Court to step in, is that the judge is saying, nope, you still got to pay this. You got to pay this crazy, insane, totally insane fine before you actually get to the appellate court. So think of the damage done. Think of the precedent this sets. If the government can say, you know what, we're going to fine you, and even though you're going to appeal it, but we're going to ruin you in the process. We're going to ruin your business. We're going to ruin everything that you have tried to build while you wait around for your appeal because you weren't able to meet the, the half a billion dollar bond bail. That's kind of crazy. Really crazy, shall we say. I mean, look, I, I, I'm just blown away by it, all of it. And I, I hope for everyone's sake that this is addressed. And it's addressed fairly because this is just a really egregious example of the courts and the state just getting way too big and trying to muscle their way in, in things that they just shouldn't be involved in, period. I mean, really and truly, it absolutely insane stuff. I mean, this is a, another organization I'll just tell you about, americansforprosperity.org, wonderful organization that is really championing small business and big business, business in general, right? Because we are a capitalist nation. I say right at the top of YouTube, guess what? I am a red-blooded American capitalist, and I am through and through. Live free or die, New Hampshire, baby, okay? Those were the first words that I could read. <laughs> And we've got no state income tax in New Hampshire. We've got no sales tax in New Hampshire. I mean, somehow we still make it all work without all those taxes. Somehow, you know what? Great place to be. And University of New Hampshire, I didn't go there, but a lot of family members have, gets rated over and over again as one of the best places for the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Listen, we need as a nation to get back to those roots. And this is what AmericansForProsperity.org understands. And so they're working hard to make sure that, you know what, if Trump gets elected, come November, November 5th, then he goes in with the, the wind at his back, as we like to say, we Irish folks, right? You have the wind right there at your back because he needs the Senate and he needs the House. And so they're actively looking for all they can do to make sure that those seats are won because he's not the whole show, okay? If he gets it, great. I think you get a much better shot than if you get Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in there, but you're going to need the House and you're going to need the Senate in order to get the right kinds of tax policies and the right kinds of policies to enable us all to have the freedom, if you would, to prosper, right? The freedom to actually do that and not be threatened by the likes of zealous prosecutors trying to interfere with business, for goodness sakes. Anyway, americansforprosperity.org. I encourage you to go there and sign up for them too. I mean, we got a lot going on these days, do we not? We have a lot. You know, all they want to do is tax you and tax you and tax you. They want to go after Trump and they want to go after you. And what's frightening about the environment we're in is how they're almost, well, dare I, I don't even need to say almost. I mean, it really feels as though they are targeting you and me and anyone who dares to think differently. Now, if you're watching this, you know, maybe you're a really vocal person, maybe you're not. If you're really vocal, you're going to have trouble. Right? If, you, if you tweet something that they don't like, they, the establishment, don't like, you actually could be in jeopardy of losing your job. So politics has taken on a whole new meaning, and good old live free or die New Hampshire, you know what? We used to always just deal with it. You could have any kind of bumper sticker you wanted on your car. You could have any kind of sign-up. It was expected that you would, and you know what? Everybody was civil about it. Not as much today, even there. 
But this is who we historically were in the state of New Hampshire, and by the way, who we historically were in the United States of America up until recently, because now it's like, okay, you're canceled. If you don't agree with us, if you're, oh my God, if you're like a, a MAGA person that actually believes in low taxes and a border and, and bring in all that offshore money back on shore through tax incentives so that you have jobs here, creation of jobs in America, gosh darn it, then you're, you're, you're a horrible person. And you're now in jeopardy of maybe losing your job. You're in jeopardy of Big Brother keeping a close eye on you. I mean, there was a story the other day. Even Jamie Dimon, who's the, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, had to come out and say enough already. They were profiling people who had shopped at Dick's Sporting Goods it, 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 at banks. And there was like a whole system to do this. I mean, come on. You're suddenly... Typecast, if you, and I think Walmart was in there too. Walmart and Dick's Point Goods. Okay, you want some deals and maybe you're into the outdoors. Well, they think that somehow you're, you're one of those MAGA people. And so this is rather scary. They're, they're also doing a lot. You remember they wanted to go after you if you had so much as $600 in your bank account? That was Janet Yellen's idea at Treasury. They thought this would be just brilliant. We can go find all the billionaires that are trying to dodge their taxes by going after anybody who has so much as $600 going through their bank account in any given year. Are you kidding me? I don't think so. I think, I think Americans deserve a little more privacy than that. And by the way, you know, it's not the people shopping at Walmart and Dick's Sporting Goods and have $600 to their name that you need to go after, thank you very much. I mean, Hunter Biden wasn't really paying the taxes, right? And then there's this thing called carried interest, or I like to call it the fat cat tax loophole, which all the Biden friends who are in the private equity industry take advantage of because they don't count their actual income. And I mean, it's income. They cash out, okay? And they, they get a check and they get a check and they say, well, this was my investment. It's not, it's their income. They get a portion of whatever deal they do. It's literally income, but they're saying, okay, now we're going to go after anything that's on paper. So Donald Trump, oh, look at this. You made three and a half billion dollars in your IPO of Truth Social or your SPAC deal with DWAC and Trump Media. Okay, three and a half billion. Well, even if you don't sell those shares, Donald, we're going to take our percentage of them. That's what they want to do. So, hey, you know what? You've got a house. You think it's worth 200000 Maybe Letitia thinks it's worth 500000 That's her being more generous because you see it's going to help her in this environment. Bear with me, okay? So you got a house that's worth two hundred. dollars Letitia and company, they say, no, we think it's worth 500000 Well, now they're going to want you to pay the tax bill on the full $500,000. they are deciding what it's worth as opposed to you knowing it's worth. So that would actually work in a different way. She'd want to inflate the value so she could get you to pay more tax. This is Senator Wyden talking to Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary. They're trying to scheme together ways to get the billionaires to pay their fair share, except it's really not the billionaires they're going after. It's anyone, and I know, you know, look, these are huge amounts of money. It's anyone with 100 million bucks in assets. So you could be a business owner and have a business that's worth $100 million, and even though you're not going to sell your business and you're not going to realize those gains, they want to go after that business and demand their fair share. Watch this. Madam Secretary, tax dodging in America has many faces, whether Hundreds. it's a crooked Swiss banker hiding American income, a billionaire deducting the personal use of private jets and super yachts, or the nearly 1,000 millionaires who somehow got away without even filing a tax return until the IRS really began to crack down. We have seen these tax dodges in a whole assortment of different uh, strategies. The biggest loophole, as I indicated, is buy, borrow, and die. You know, buy, borrow, and die is a glide path for billionaires to pay little or nothing, as I said, for years on end. Can you explain, Madam Secretary, why it's so important for billionaires to start paying taxes on this income? Because that's what it is. I agree with you. 
Under current law, some of the wealthiest Americans pay very little tax because they receive their income as capital gains, and those capital gains aren't taxed until realized and may escape income taxation entirely at death. So the president's budget would impose a minimum tax of 25% on total income, inclusive of unrealized capital gains. Mm. It would apply to the wealthiest one hundredth of a percent of taxpayers with more than $100 million in wealth. And the proposal would put an end to the situation that exists today okay, no, uh, no, in wait, which wealthy what it would households, actually do, I just have noted, to jump in because I can't listen to this anymore. And, you know, look, I know, you know, if you've got paper value of $100 million, that's a big deal. But, like, who's deciding that paper value? It's on paper, for goodness sakes. You don't actually get the money. You don't have the money. So you got a, an investment in a stock, and it shoots up. And it's worth $100 million. And then, by the way, it goes to zero the next year. There's companies that have done that. Lehman Brothers comes to mind, right? You can go straight to zero. But Janet and Biden and Kamala want to grab their 25% of your $100 million. I mean, this is ridiculous. It would actually work towards incentivizing people not to create wealth. Why don't we just all go work for Uncle Sam and Uncle Joe, right? Like, forget about it. You don't want to be worth 101. You don't want to be worth 100. You better keep that at $99 million because if you go to 100, boom, they're coming for you. You understand how fundamentally wrong this is? Everything that's happening right now is so wrong. And it's socialism. I mean, this is, it's socialism. And these people are the ones that did it to us in the, in the first place over the last three years. Think about what has happened since Joe Biden came to office? Inflation. Inflation has happened. They are destroying the value of our dollars. They're destroying the country. They're destroying our economy. And you know what? It's Joe Biden. It's the House and the Senate. Anyone who votes for this, this ridiculous budget he's got, I, I'm sorry. And then it's this guy over here, Jay Powell. So... You're right. They're pretty modest changes, but you're right. There was an uptick in the, in the longer run rate. And uh... here he is talking about interest rates. So what what's going on here is a reporter saying, like, basically, are we going to expect that we're going to have higher interest rates in the future? And the Fed is trying to be careful here. You know, they kind of want to have their cake and eat it, too, because they want everybody to think that rates are going lower. Right. They're promising three more rate cuts this year because they want to free up capital, et cetera. They want the stock market to do well, et cetera. But you can't have your cake and eat it too, because if you actually do those three rate cuts, you're going to be looking at even more inflation. They're a big part of the reason why we have 18% inflation, ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen. Uh, and also there's a 25 basis point increase in, in 25 and 26. In terms of um, are rates going to be higher in the, in the longer run, if that's really your question, I, I don't think we know that. Um, I, I think uh, it's it's we think that rates were generally low during the pre pandemic post global financial crisis era for for reasons that are mostly, you know, uh, important, slow moving, large things like demographics and productivity and, and, and that sort of thing, okay, things that don't move quickly. Um, but I don't think we know. I mean, I, my, so, my instinct would be that. And, and, and maybe that's, that's a fair assessment and that, that he really doesn't know because clearly he didn't know. I mean, if he knew, why on earth would he have printed so much money? Why would Joe Biden have handed out a, well, we know Joe Biden was going to hand out a third stimulus check. And we know Chuck Schumer wants like as much as he can possibly get. They don't care. They'll print as much money as they can. But the Federal Reserve, they're supposed to be a little bit more responsible. I mean, I have this whole theory that maybe he wanted to keep his job. And his ex-boss, who used to run the Fed, went over to Treasury. And she suddenly became a political animal in a way that she previously, we hope, had not been. And so maybe there was some pressure on him. You've got to keep the spigot open. We've got to keep this going. They were, they were fearful, and this is what he was getting at in that discussion, that, that somehow there was never going to be inflation. That it, because of these demographic shifts and because of the technological improvements, et cetera, there was never going to be inflation. I mean, they had tried before and they couldn't get it. In fact, some people were worried about deflation. Well, 
I, I, I mean, I hate to say I told you so, but I did. I sat right here in this very studio talking to you guys and was like, listen, it's going to happen. There's no way that you can print this much this many times around, put this much money into circulation. Think about the M2 money supply that just, just inflated in ways that we had never seen in an entire generation, multiple generations. You were going to get inflation. Now, I said that. Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, former head of the National Economic Council under Bill Clinton, he said that. But most people were kind of like, well, you know, we'll see. We'll wait and see. Well, look at what that got us. Listen, I, I, I will just say this. Like, it's really important that you take your financial future into consideration. It is one of the reasons why I'm very proud to have debuted 76 Research dot com this month 76 research.com is is my baby as we say i have for many years felt so passionately about the financial education of individuals and the importance of you guys really saving for your future and doing so in a methodic systematic long-term model because one day you want to retire and that money's got to be worth something when you retire right so you've got to have some kind of nest egg that you're putting aside and there's ways to do that smart smart ways to do that so i wanted to be able to share this with you i have a fair amount of knowledge and macro sort of sensibility that i've i've built up over my <clears throat> what is this now 24 years in <laughs> covering wall street yeah it, it i mean i started off at, at goldman sachs way back when uh, uh, a long time ago, because that would have been back in 99, just as Hugo Chavez was coming to power in Venezuela and we were trading some of the sovereign debt in some of those places. So when I say I've seen this movie before and it makes me very nervous, I'm not kidding. Anyway, I started 76 with a long, long time friend, Rob Horton, who spent 25 years on Wall Street and knows financial markets inside and out and was a fund manager for some major firms running billions of dollars. Anyway, Rob is brilliant. And so... I like to think I am too. <laughs> Between the two of us, I think we got you covered. Go check it out, 76research.com. There's a ton of free stuff. You can sign up for one of the model portfolios where you get 10 to 15 stocks that we really believe in long-term for your future. Or you can look at some of the other offerings like the 76 report, which will give you some sampling of what we're looking at in the model portfolios. Or you can just take the free stuff. So go to 76research.com today. Um, speaking of business news, really quick, Apple. Apple, I mean, this actually, Actually relates back to 76. I should point that out because Apple is a company that is now, um, well, under a lot of pressure today because you've got the Justice Department and 15 states coming forward and suing Apple for antitrust issues. And, you know, look, I mean, they, there may be something there. I mean, Apple is uh, quite the quite the monopoly, if you ask me, because, well, it's it's pretty much what I use. I do have a, a, a Android phone as well, but Apple is at least for me anyway, my priority and what I use, and they kind of keep you in their ecosystem. It's more complicated if you're a business and you have an app because they take a nice healthy percentage of your fees, and that's become an issue. It became an issue with Epic Games, and Epic Games lost that lawsuit, but the, the lawsuit continued at the at the government level. Now, cynics would say, hey, you know what? This is just the Biden administration trying to flex itself and position itself so that it has companies doing its bidding ahead of the election. Um, but those of us who actually think that maybe Apple is getting a little too big for its own good might say there, there is some there there. We'll see how this all plays out. But shares of Apple traded down a little bit as a result of that news. And here's a story that was in the Wall Street Journal today. And as I tweeted out, I said, look, this is huge. This is big. U.S. is suing Apple. And it's alleging that the tech giant exploits illegal monopoly. Justice Department says company makes it difficult for competitors to integrate with iPhones. So in other words, if you are an Epic Games subscriber and you want to move um, your game platform outside of the Apple ecosystem, it becomes really challenging to do so. What ultimately in that particular case, the court decided was that Epic Games wasn't actually sort of um, threatened enough by Apple, that it still had other places to go because the gaming market is what it is. And a lot of people are on Androids for gaming. But in other sectors, it's kind of like Apple or nothing. And so what will certainly be interesting to see is how this all gets, gets decided. I mean, and look, you know what? Apple is a big deal stock. 
You know, it's, it's part of the S&P. It's, it's a big deal stock and a lot of people are holding it. So it's never ideal when shares of Apple are trading lower. And they did uh, trade a bit lower today as a result of this this issue. But nonetheless, the market overall, I think, uh, closed up quite nicely. Let me give you some of those numbers. Yeah, with the Dow closing up seven-tenths of a percent to S&P, even though Apple uh, was getting hit, Apple trading down. Um, let me see if I can give you those exact numbers the S&P 500 still traded up. So we're looking at new highs there, which is just incredible. Apple trading down 4% on the day at $171.37. And it's because of this. The U.S. Justice Department is suing Apple and alleging that this is a monopoly and it's exploiting its monopoly, making it very, very difficult for applications to be integrated and they take a really hefty percentage, I think some 30% of those app fees. So if you have a product and you have an app that you've developed and you want to put it on the, the Apple platform, well, great. Apple's like, thank you very much. That's a nice little tax. I'll take my 30%. And the 30% might be a little bit egregious, but there's really nowhere else to go because it has a hold. These are the, the allegations that are coming forward on that ecosystem, and they don't make it easy for you to move off of it. So watch that one, you guys. It, hey, you know what? For, for some people, this might be a buying opportunity for Apple. I remember when I was first starting in business news, one of the first stories I did was the Microsoft breakup because the government was ordering a breakup of Microsoft. And it was my first day on the air. I got pulled out of HR at Bloomberg Television back in the year 2000. And they were like, you got to go on air with this, four o'clock, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a second, I have my glasses and I don't have the right clothes and this and that and the other. But anyway, I did all my, uh, all my reporting and, and talked to some very good sources and got that story down. It turned out that the government actually never followed through with that and Microsoft didn't get broken up. But that was their intention because they said it was a monopoly. So this is a huge story. Watch it very, very, very carefully. Um, and then, of course, watch what's happening with Trump. I want to give a big plug to our friends over at Bounce of Nature, you guys. I'm looking at all your positive comments. And thank you so much for that. I, I'm never one to turn down a compliment. And I want to give a plug for Bounce of Nature because I think that they deserve a little bit of credit in this. I've been taking the fruits and veggie capsules and... They're amazing. I think they're amazing. I think it's a big part of why I feel so good and why hopefully I, I look okay too. 1-800-246-8751. A friend of mine, he's actually a music teacher for, for my children, called me the other day and said, oh my gosh, you take Balance of Nature too. I absolutely love it. I've been doing this for years. And I'm like, I know, like, I mean, it was just interesting to hear another individual who was taking it, who's, who's a friend. It was sort of funny because I didn't even I didn't even know he was listening to the podcast. I had no idea. And then he was not only listening, he was like, I love the Balance of Nature is one of the sponsors on your program. So we are happy to have them on board. I have been taking it for several months. I feel fantastic. You can get a 35% discount and you can get $10 off and you can get free shipping if you use my name, code word Trish. That's the balance of nature code that you need. 1-800-246-8751 or go to their website. Use the code. Use the code. It's worth it. Believe me. I really feel like this is absolutely great. And going out to some of the comments from all of you, it's good to have you here. I want to thank some of you for your patronage. It is very nice to see the support for individual creators individual creators here on the YouTube platform. So thank you for that very much. Um, I, I, I love seeing all these familiar faces. I love seeing new ones as well. I see one of you guys is brand, a few of you are just saying, hey, you just joined today. Don, excellent. Don is like on your case all the time. Don back. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, wonderful. We, did we get over a thousand likes? He, oh my goodness, we're at 1,120. How many likes do we have? Well, Don, I'll let you do. I, I think we're way up there. We're getting a lot of likes. So thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate Don staying on you, and I appreciate you all doing your part. Mike and Ian, it's so good to see you guys. Um, Hightower, thank you so much for those kind comments. And, and Mike, <laughs> I'm groovy, okay? <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you, Leslie. Welcome back. It's good to see you. You know, we have a nice little team here. David, David as well. I was thinking maybe if you guys are around tomorrow, for those of you that are in sort of the, the team membership, we'll do like a little, a little small chat if, if you guys are up for it, right? We've been wanting to do something like that. So maybe tomorrow afternoon, if you have some time, we can schedule that. 
dare I say, maybe around the three, four o'clock hour. What do you think? What do you think? Um, anyway, Don, yeah, it's very interesting that the whole chapter 12 reorganization, he can do that. Donald Trump can file for bankruptcy and it actually, from a financial perspective, might be the easiest, best thing for him. But I can tell you, I don't, I don't think that that's his preferred choice. I really think that he would like to, to do this differently. Although he can spin anything. I, I think I've told you guys before, first time I ever met Donald Trump, a long time ago, this might have been back in 2004, and he had, or maybe 2005, no, I think it was 2004, it was fall of 2004, or, or winter of 2004, he had just filed bankruptcy at the Atlantic City casinos. Well, technically, I met him before that, because I was in the Miss America pageant, and he used to be a sponsor, and Trump Tower there at Atlantic City used to house some of the contestants. I did not get to stay in that hotel, but um, I, I do have a picture of myself at, at the Atlantic City Trump thing. It's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just funny how life works, right? Anyway, uh, it, that, that was probably the first time I met him just in a group setting. And then years later, when I was a correspondent, network correspondent, doing a story on his bankruptcy, he came into the room and he said, Trish, isn't this fantastic? Absolutely fantastic. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> but his point was was that it financially was a good deal for him and for his company. Um, maybe not so much for the bondholders. Anyway, I got to leave it there. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk again tomorrow.